Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corley from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and welcome to Playload. This is all my video game pickups for the month of August 2018. Uh, before we get on with all the stuff that's on the table, one thing you will not see, just because frankly it's all set up and I did not want to take it out, here's a clip of it. Uh, this is the Gecko. This is by the Bahar Bros. This is a Dreamcast HDMI box. It's great, it's exactly what it sounds like. I did a video on it, feel free to check that out but I didn't feel any great need to disconnect it just to put it on this table. So there you go. That's that's one thing I got. Just want to thank again the Bahar Bros for that and I remind you to check out the video if that sounds interesting to you. Really cool product. But moving on, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff here as you can see. This has been a weird month because as cool as a lot of this stuff is and everything, most of it I didn't buy. Like a lot of this I just kind of got through various circumstances. So. I kind of wanted to talk you through my month as I explain where all this weird stuff came from. Because um, it's been strange, and it gets stranger at the end, trust me. Uh, but yeah, so uh, this month started very much literally where the last one ended, the very end of July. Sega brought me out to London to film a thing with Yogg's cast and Hat Films. Technically it was in Bristol, but I went to London, then up to Bristol. Um, and while I was there, you know, I did, like I said, I did this Shenmue challenge thing with Yogg's cast and Hat Films, which please check those out. They're cool, funny videos. Uh, there's a behind the scenes of that on this channel, which has already come out. You can check it out if you like. Uh, and it was cool because at the time, uh, when it was still relevant, like right, you know, right at the initial release, you could actually win a trip to Japan by going through there. I tweeted about it, but it was weird because like nobody cared, and I was like, "You can win a trip to Japan." Nobody cared. It was weird, uh, but whatever. Uh, congratulations to the winner. Um, but anyway. Yeah, so uh, before I did all that, before I did all the stuff with Yogg's cast, uh, I had a couple of days in London proper to do stuff over at Sega's headquarters. Uh, they let me do a live 100,000 subscriber special from their office, which was really neat. Unfortunately, they it was kind of a 24-hour thing is what they, they wanted it to be, so it didn't get to stay, uh, which is too bad. But it was, uh, it was cool. Um, and in addition to that, you know, just they let me see stuff and we chatted, hang out, you know, be friendly and all that fun stuff. And they gave me some random swag. I hate using that word, but they did. Uh, one of the things they gave me was a physical Xbox One copy of Sega Mega Drive Classics Collection or Sega Genesis Classics Collection. Of course, Xbox One is region free, so it really makes no difference. Uh, but yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's still sealed. It's minty fresh. I'm going to open it later and install it and stuff. But yeah, there it is. Very, very cool. I actually got to go to an event in New York City for this game uh, where I competed against uh, a bunch of people you guys would know. Um, like Pr uh, Proton John was there. Um, uh, Xavier Woods. Okay, Austin Creed of New Day was there. Uh, my buddy uh, Hip Hop Gamer was there. Uh, a lot of cool people were there. So it, it was it was you know a few months ago, but now I finally actually have a physical copy of it, which is nice. Um, the other thing they gave me was a couple copies of Sonic Mania Plus. This is the Xbox One physical edition and the Nintendo Switch physical edition. This is actually the American version. They were cool enough. They had a couple extras of these and I was like, yeah, that'll fit more with my set. Uh, and then the Switch version is still the European one, but whatever, they're all region free, so ultimately it doesn't really matter. But yeah, this is an awesome game for those who've never played it. Possibly, debatably, maybe I might go so far as to say the best Sonic game ever produced, which is obviously a high bar. Um, but yeah, these games, uh, or this game, when it originally came out digitally, I, I wanted to play it, but I, even with that big collector set they did, there was no physical you know, cart, or uh, in the case of the Switch, or in the case of the other ones, like no disc. And I was just kind of like, nah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait and hope out, you know, hope for a physical edition, which eventually Sega came through and did that. Um, now I have played it though prior to this, even though these aren't open. Uh, my stance on digital content is I will not support it, I will not buy it, uh, or as I would put it, rent it. Um, but I'm sure people will dispute that, but whatever, we're not going into that. Um, but when it's gifted to me, that's a little different. If somebody already said it, all right, fine, I'll check it out. So in the case of that, somebody had an extra digital Switch copy. Um, uh, he was on Twitter. I believe the word dog was in his username. I'm sorry, dude. I'll display your, your Twitter handle right here. Again, thank you for that. Um, but yeah, he was cool enough to give me a digital Switch copy of uh, this game a while back. And it's, it's a really good game. So this one's even better because it's physical. It has extra content and all that stuff. So really, really cool. And thank you again to Sega for hooking me up with that. Now, after that, the other thing I did while I was there 
was I, I hung out with my buddy Ben, aka Shen Muso. Now, uh, he was on the stream with me, and we usually do videos together when I bounce over to the UK for one reason or another. Um, and we have this ongoing thing where we both really like the original Xbox. We are in the small minority of people who actively try to collect for that console. Um, and we had this kind of gag trade happening where I was in Japan, and he was like, can you get me some of these Japanese like original Xbox exclusives? And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. And I went around, because they're, they're cheap as shit over there, with the one exception of being Metal Wolf Chaos, but even Metal Wolf Chaos there is like half of what it would cost to import, which I, was one of the ones I ended up finding for him. Uh, but anyway, you can watch his video and all that stuff. But yeah, I, uh, I found him a whole bunch of those things. He paid for them. We pretended like it was a trade as a gag, but really he bought them. And then uh, I brought them over to the UK. Meanwhile, he was supposed to go out and find whatever exclusives he could, the European ones, that I didn't have. Uh, now, his disadvantage, I have most of them already. Most of the ones I need are just like sports garbage. Um, and in this case, he found this. This is Fila World Tennis. This is one I actually needed. Now the even funnier part is, astute viewers of this channel will know that Ben actually already sent this to me. He sent me a package a few playloads ago of three original Xbox sports titles and this was one of them. So why is it back on this table? Well, Ben actually forgot to give me the manual when he sent it. Uh, so he had tracked down the manual and when I met up with him, he just handed me the manual and I handed him a giant stack of Japanese games. And then on the, on the stream, we kind of pretended like it was a trade, but in reality, no, that wasn't what it was. Um, but yeah, so there you go. I, I have completed another original Xbox title off the list, making the European set almost completely done. I'm very much looking forward to that being out of the way. So, I don't know why that went, wait! I don't know what that was all about. Apologies. Um, but moving on. Uh, so when the, all the UK stuff ended, I had a, man, this was intense. I woke up in the morning of August 3rd in Bristol, England, which is basically on the border of Wales, right there. And then I got a ride all the way down to London Heathrow, which is like a two hour cab ride. Got to Heathrow, took a, you know, a flight back to Chicago, where I live, where I currently am, although you would never know if you follow me on Twitter. Uh, and then uh, I changed planes in my own home airport, which as someone who lives in Chicago, I massively apologize to everyone who has to go through O'Hare. O'Hare is infamous for how bad of an airport it is. It's, the thing is when you live here, it's great because it goes to a million places, it comes, to a million pla comes from a million places, but changing planes here can be a nightmare if you're not familiar with the airport, so. I'm sorry. And I had the unique experience as someone from here who actually had to do that. Landed from London, had to go through customs and all that stuff, change terminals, and then make my St. Louis flight. Yes, I went to St. Louis. I went back to St. Louis for the Missouri Game Con. I was a guest there. This is my third year in a row being a guest. They've been there for three years, so it's awesome to kind of be the Iron Man of that content convention as far as guests go. Um, but yeah, so very, very awesome. Now, uh, that convention, uh, I got to do a panel and everything. The panel's actually already on my channel. Feel free to watch it if you like. Um, but there I got several pickups. I didn't go crazy, because um, I kind of had to plan for two trips at the same time, so all the stuff I got, from Sega and all the stuff I brought out there. I also had to bring all the St. Louis stuff there and back, you know what I mean? It was a uh, weird. Um, but so I, I bought a few things. Mostly what I got was some original Xbox stuff because original Xbox stuff still cheap. A lot of North American stuff I need, but you know, I didn't want to go overboard. So I got a few items in particular. I got Amped. Uh, Cabela's Dangerous Hunts. These games are hilarious. In case it's not clear, in case you're like, why would you want this? Um, I'm going for a complete original Xbox set, every game released. Um, I'm admitting, admitting that to myself now. The Japanese stuff's done, the European stuff's almost done, the American stuff's really what's in my way. Um, so that, gotta get certain stuff off the list. Uh, Future Tactics, The Uprising. This one, by far, the sweetest one. Uh, Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Uh, shout out to my buddy Trey Wagner, who you guys might know if you listen to the podcast. He um, he supports the channel. This is like one of his all-time favorite games. So right there, man, right there. It's right in your face. <laughs> I got Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Um, Tony Hawk's Underground. And finally, ESPN Football. Um, 2K4 specifically. Now, yeah, you gotta get the sports games off the list. This one though is actually worthy of a story, which I only became aware of this very recently. Uh, you guys know me. Bit of a Shenmue fan, mentioned it a couple of times, um, but this, <laughs> 
So when it comes to Shenmue, the, he, for the longest time there wasn't much in the way of merchandise and Ryo Hazuki as a character, any Shenmue references are, are very rarely uh, apparent in other Sega content. Like there's the obvious ones like Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing, he was in that. Um, but there's, there's really not many. This is by far his weirdest cameo. Yes, he, Ryo Hazuki is in this game. I know. Sega actually for a while was the ones making the uh, sports licensed games for, they, they did the 2K series before, you know, uh, they sold off visual concepts to Take Two, who then spun it off into its own entity called 2K, which is the guys we know now. But for a while, Sega was making sports titles. And in this one, they put Ryo Hazuki as an unlockable character. And I'm never gonna do it because I hate football and I hate football games. I'm sorry to the rest of America who loves football, but I do not. Um, even to my fellow Chicago you know, Bears fans, I'm sorry, I just, I, I don't care. I just don't care. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was always a basketball guy. But anyway, so yeah, Ryo Hazuki is in this game and apparently to get him, you have to complete 100 career interceptions, which it is my understanding that that is very difficult. I don't know, but yes, apparently it is. So there is no video footage of this. Um, in fact, I, the, I, even in researching this, the only image I could find was some guy on Twitter actually successfully sat down and did it. So the images I'm gonna show you are the same ones that have been floating around. But yeah, Ryo Hazuki, for whatever reason, is a hidden character in this. So it's kind of a cool little, only Shenmue fans would really appreciate that, I think. So yeah, I got that. Although I, that's not why I got it. I got it because it's on the list, but it turns out there's a story to it. Okay, so I got that stuff. The only other thing I bought um, was this. This is WWF Raw for the Sega 32X. I might start pursuing more Sega 32X stuff. Recently, I saw a video, I think it was Digital Foundry's video, where he, was, he went through like every single 32X game, and I, there was less games there than I had remembered. Um, and then I looked at my own collection and I realized I have the majority of them and I even have most of the heavy hitters. So I was like, maybe I should do this. Um, and some of them I just screwed up over the years. Like I knew there was a WWF game and it was WrestleMania. I have it. So I was like, oh, all right, I have the WWF game and I would never look for another one. It wasn't until I watched this video, I was like, oh shit, there were two. <laughs> and I didn't have the other one. So I went in and grabbed that. Same with like baseball. There's um, World Series baseball and there's RBI baseball. World Series baseball is very rare, expensive, and hard to find. RBI baseball, not so much. And I was like, ah, crap, you know, then I have to look into that. Turns out I have World Series baseball. I don't have RBI baseball. I have the expensive, hard to find one, not the cheaper, common one. So then it became a more plausible goal. So I might start doing that, although if I do that, I'm accepting right now that some will be complete and boxed, some will be loose carts. I don't care at that point. But if I can get a boxed one, I'll probably do that instead. But in this case, just picked up one, which is WWF Raw. Um, except for Dark Side, that 32X European exclusive, never getting that. I'll get a repro of that one, that's fine. I'll, I'll settle for that. But time enough for that uh, later. Speaking of repros, I got one. This is a gift from a buddy of mine. His name is Jake, uh, AKA Zebular. He does YouTube videos, check him out. Um, he is got one of the guys that runs the Missouri Game Con and he hooked me up with this. This is a reproduction cart of Star Fox 2. Uh, not an uncommon practice, but what makes this one kind of special is for years, uh, the Star Fox 2 ROM that existed on the internet had been kind of dumped by illegitimate means. Uh, it was an incomplete version of the game. However, when Nintendo released the SNES Mini, they completed the game and they put it on there. In less than a day, the ROM appeared online. Um, now people started making reproduction cartridges using that. My buddy did that as well. So you can get it right now if you really want to. This is a physical cartridge. It will plug right into a Super Nintendo and you will have Star Fox 2 in its final form on a physical cart. It made a very nice label for it and everything. Um, the only thing that's weird about it is that because of the, the nature of the game, it requires a sacrificial FX, I believe FX2 chip. Um, and so we actually looked into that. Turns out there's only a couple of games that used it, which means you have to sacrifice one uh, in order to make it work. But there's a game that's recommended for it, which is, I believe, is Dirt Tracks FX. Um, and there's a Japanese version of Dirt, Traf Dirt Tracks FX, which is really worthless. So, since I was in Japan all the time, we basically said, hey man, grab me a bunch of those cheap Super Famicom, Super Dirt, Traf Dirt Tracks FX games, and I'll make you one of these for free. That's exactly what I did. So I rounded up every copy I could, which I think ended up being like six copies, because they were only like two bucks each, and it was like, done, deal, fair. So he's got a bunch, he can now make more carts, and I have a complete cart too. So thank you very much to Jake. 
Uh, at the convention, hung out with a lot of people, including the Metal Jesus Rocks crew. Almost all of them were entirely there. Um, and one of them, which would be my buddy uh, John Riggs, or Rigged Gaming, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know, he was giving these out. These are little uh, cartridge cleaning cards. Um, and basically, one end you keep dry, and one end you keep, you know, you put liquid on, and you just use them to clean cartridges. Like, you know, it's right there in the pins. He just had like a bucket of these he was giving away for free, but he just handed me one. And I was like, oh yeah, sure, all right, thank you, man. So, shout out to John Riggs. Also, shout out to Rad Radical Reggie, who hooked me up with this. I believe this is a Nintendo Switch cleaning cloth for the screen. It's still in its plastic wrap, so I haven't really done anything with it, but it looks like a cleaning cloth, so I'm pretty sure that's what that is. So thank you, Reggie. The other thing Reggie gave me was this. Uh, this is a Dreamcast dust cover. You take it out, it's the shape of a Dreamcast, and it would fit, well, what do you know? There happens to be one right here. It would fit right over this and just protect it from dust. Um, he actually had a bunch of these from different platforms he didn't really want, but he was like, I oh, Dreamcast, you, go ahead. So thank you very much to Reggie for that. Um, but yes, speaking of Dreamcast, um, so you'll see I have a Dreamcast here. Looks very standard, right? This is a weird situation. Uh, I was at the convention and, you know, people who watch the channel would come up occasionally, take photos, whatever, all that good stuff. Um, sometimes people give me things, uh, which you certainly don't have to do. Never is expected, never is required, nothing like that. Um, but sometimes people still do it. Uh, in this case, a dude named Tom came up to me and he just started asking me questions about the Dreamcast and stuff. And then he said, uh, do you have a Revision 2 Dreamcast? And I was like, nah, man, I've never even seen one. He opens his backpack and he just takes one out. And he's like, here you go, this is a Revision 2 Dreamcast. I'm like sitting there looking, I'm like, oh, that's cool, man. And I look and I confirm, yeah, it's a Revision 2 Dreamcast. He's like, yeah, it's yours. And I was like, huh? And he, long story short, he gave it to me. I, I tried to turn it down, but he was like, nah, man, it's yours. Um, and then he said, uh, I, I, he said that, you know, the, uh, that, Having one of these is essentially winning an unlucky lottery. Um, and what he meant by that is very simple. So let me explain. At the bottom of an American Dreamcast, I think the, the other Dreamcasts will have this, but the American ones seem to be the ones easiest to identify. You'll see this like label on the bottom with all sorts of information. At the very bottom down here next to NTSCU, you'll see a circle and in it there will be a number. Now the most common number you will see is a one. Uh, however, it's also possible to see a zero and a two. Uh, the zero is the second most common because it was available in Japan for basically a year, and then the very early models in the in the states and I think Europe as well were also revision zero. Then they changed some stuff, and the vast majority of the Dreamcasts that are out there are revision one. But at the very very tail end of the Dreamcast lifespan, I mean like maybe a month at most, like it wasn't long. They did some more changes and that became the revision two, which is what this is. Now, from the surface, it doesn't look any different. There's really nothing indicating anything special about it other than that two. But the reason it's special, I guess, internally is uh, for years, and I've seen this debate online for years and I could never confirm it because as I told Tom, I'd literally never seen a revision two in person, but Supposedly what had happened is uh, Sega became very aware of the mill CD exploit, which is really the thing that's in the Dreamcast that allows it to play burned games as well as what we now use it for, which is really to write independent game code. Um, that was stripped out of the revision two, or so we were taught, or told. But the thing is, I could never test it myself. And every time I saw a post about this, I would see, for every person who said, yeah, revision two can't play burned content, I would see another person that says it can. So I never really knew where to sit on that. Um, I kind of tend to decide with the people who said it could because they seem to be more prevalent about it. Because most of the people who said it couldn't were just kind of repeating information they had heard as opposed to actually having one, at least that was my experience with it. However, I now have a revision two Dreamcast and I tested it out. At least this one can't read burned content. It can't read mill CD content, which means any independent game I threw at it, it would not read. Any burned game I threw at it, it would not read. But legitimate GD-ROMs, specifically American ones, it would read. Now that's a, that's actually makes it even more useless because it can only read the North American official library. You can't actually play imports on this one because you can't get a boot disk to run on it unless you hack it in different ways, which I'm not going to do. Which is what Tom meant when, it, when he said, it's to win an unlucky lottery. It's very rare, but it sucks at doing what it's supposed to do. But nevertheless, thank you very much, Tom. It is a very cool thing to add to the Dreamcast collection. It, it is a unique piece for me because never had one before. So thank you very much. 
shortly after all the St. Louis stuff and everything, I at one point uh, was sent out to San Francisco for a Ubisoft event. Now that's common. They send me to a lot of stuff for them. Uh, this one is was specifically the pre-Gamescom event, which basically was just all the stuff Ubisoft was going to have at Gamescom the week after they had there then. And you, you know, they bring people out and you can check out the games, play them, have a good time, record footage, that kind of stuff. Got my nice little badge there and everything. Um, and those type of things don't usually have much, you know, if you want to use the swag word again, they don't usually have that stuff. Uh, but in this case, <laughs> interesting situation comes up. I, I go and I play the games I want to play and get footage of and all that stuff, and I get around to Trials Rising. Now, Trials Rising, I had played at E3, and I loved that game. Loved it. So I wanted to spend a lot of time just playing that and having a good time with it. Um, but I'm not a very competitive person. I want everybody to know that up front. Um, my buddy, Hip Hop Gamer, who I mentioned before, sits down, and um, we're, we're chatting for a minute, and they mention this contest about how they're giving away some headphones to the person who has the best time that day. Uh, and for whatever reason, Hip Hop Gamer's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick your ass. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat you. I was like... I'm not even like I'm not even competing here, man. Um, but for some reason, it kind of pissed me off because he ended up like kicking ass in that level, and he got like a minute forty. And I was like, oh, that's really good. I want to beat that. And then I asked what the best time was. And they said it was 127. I was like, that's unrealistic. So my goal is to just beat Hip Hop Gamer. I just I just want to do that because he had beat me at that Sega Genesis thing, and I was just like, break even, man. Like that's what I want to do right now. So I I was just playing the level, and eventually I got 132. So that beat him, but then I was like, dude, I'm five seconds away, you know, from getting the best time. Why don't I just keep doing this? So I just kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. And eventually I got the best time. I got one minute and 24 seconds. I was like, yo! I called over all my Ubisoft buddies. I'm like, fucking I did it. And they were impressed. Yes, I got the best time. So I got a free set of headphones. And then I, I went over to Hip Hop Gamer. I was like, yo, man, what, what the fuck happened? I, I got this and you, you didn't. Yeah, I thought he would give me some shit, but he was all like, no, he was really happy for me and stuff. Um, Awesome guy if you ever meet him. Um, but anyway, so yeah, they hooked me up with some headphones. So I'm going to show you guys right now because I haven't even taken them out of the wrapping here. I just wanted to keep them this way. Um, they are, I don't know much about them because I haven't read, I didn't open them yet. But so they've got uh, obviously a headphone jack. They've got a USB for charging. Um, they look pretty nice, very soft and uh, just a pair of cool ass gaming headphones. And they're customized. They have a Trials Rising thing on the side there. So let's try them on for a second. I feel like a World War II like <laughs> uh, operator or something. Uh, they're, 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 they're pretty noise canceling. That's pretty good. I like that. I mean, I'm gonna have to try those out later and see how, how well they actually work out. But that's awesome. Um, yeah. And then they have a play button, power button. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely tink, uh, tinker with that later. But that's very cool. So thank you to the guys at uh, Trials Dev Team um, uh, at Ubisoft for letting me win. I don't know how else to phrase it. I won. I shouldn't have won. I'm not very competitive. But I won. I won. I won, son. Um, but anyway, moving on. Uh, now, of course, I picked up this other game most people don't really care about, so I'm just going to bounce right over. It's Shenmue 1 and 2 re-release collection on PS4 and Xbox One. Who cares? No. <laughs> Obviously, as I'm, there's no point in going in it in this video. Obviously, I'm very, very passionate about Shenmue 1 and 2 and the re-release and everything that's Shenmue related. Big, huge thing for me. Um, yeah, I, I've done the whole video, as you guys already know, so there's not much else to say. I will say, if you've picked it up, um, there are bug patches. Make sure you get those. They really improve the experience uh, because, you know, uh, it's just how it is. Unfortunately, certain builds, the, the build on disc is not the final build. Um, but to Sega's credit, um, they care. I know people are giving them shit, like, why wasn't the thing done? You don't understand. It, it, development cycles don't work like that. And I know it sucks. I know it sucks. And I'm not defending that. It's, uh, I agree, shit should be done when it comes out. But unlike a lot of other guys, in this case, Sega created like a literal open forum and they're like, any bugs you see, tell us, we want to fix them. Um, and some people are saying, oh, fuck them. I, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna help them. And they're, while they're using their market as a, as a bug testing service, as a debug kit. And I'm like, well, there is a certain logic to that. I gotta defend them on that because at least they're willing to communicate with us and be like, what are your issues? We want to work with you. That's great on their behalf. So you know, interpret it however you want. But either way, I'm very happy these are here. And I already told this story once, but I'm gonna tell this again real quick for people who perhaps didn't watch that video. 
I got a quasi pickup here. You guys have seen this copy of Shenmue behind me for years. This got updated recently. This was originally signed by Yu Suzuki. Uh, then later I got my buddy Corey Marshall, voice actor of Rio, and I call him a buddy now, um, to sign it. But there was one omission, and I recently got to take care of that. I was I went out to Washington D.C. for a little bit earlier this month, literally for a photo op. It's a very weird situation. Um, but I got Masaya Matsu Matsukaze to sign it. Uh, he was the Japanese voice actor of Rio. And so now I have both Rios as well as Yu Suzuki signing it. Uh, very cool. Uh, he commu we, we had to talk through his translator, but it was funny. He actually, uh, they knew who I was. <laughs> like, they're like, oh yeah, you're that Shenmue guy. <laughs> At first they thought I was a Sega employee, which I corrected. I was like, no, no, no I don't work for Sega. And they're like, oh, well, whatever. Um, and a credit to my, uh, shout out to my buddy Mike, um, who actually worked at the convention. He's actually one of the guys running it. And he let me and my buddy James, as well as uh, Brendan, he jumped us to the front of the, like, the VIP section before like, like all the lines open, he was just cool enough to be like, yeah, yeah, I'll help you out and we'll get you over there. And I'm not making a secret about that because it was a very nice thing for him to do and we didn't do it that at anyone else's expense. We did it before the lines even really opened just so we would get it done, get the business done and get out of there. So um, yeah, it was it was very cool to be able to do that. He, you know, Masaya was cool enough to chat with us for a bit because uh, for him, Shenmue fans are rare because Shenmue has never been that popular in Japan. But uh, to him, you know, like the only fans that ever show up show up in Europe or show up in North America. And it's my understanding he doesn't do many conventions. Um, so yeah, that was cool. He's more actually what he's more known for is he's a Power Ranger and an anime voice actor and you know these other things. He was even in a Godzilla movie. I think it was Godzilla versus Megaguirus, and that that was weird because I recognized him from that. But I didn't, you know, I wouldn't look at him and be like, oh, that's Rio. Uh, but that's what he was as well. So, yeah, I think he kind of appreciated uh, that. And then he, he even made a joke. He said <laughs> when it was about uh, Shenmue, he's like, oh, yeah, you should tell Sego that, that we need a Shenmue 3 through his translator. And I was like, does he know that there is one? And he's like, well, yeah, he's making a joke. He's in it. I'm like, right, of course. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. Um, but, yeah, so got the Shenmue re-releases as well as that. Now, moving on, uh, we got a couple of packages here. Um, you see one. There's another one that's off camera. I'm gonna literally have to turn off everything, move all this stuff, because the thing is huge. But we'll get to that in a minute. First up, this package comes from Castlemania Games. Uh, my buddy Ryan runs Castlemania Games. Hell of a nice guy. Um, and occasionally he just sends me stuff. Um, and you know, sometimes people do that and they're like, hey, do a video on it. Ryan's like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> like, do whatever you want with it. You can throw it away, I don't care. Um, so I, I, in this case, uh, I know what this is to an extent, um, but I'm not gonna be doing a dedicated video on it. It's just, it's not really my thing to cover. So basically he just kind of gave it to me as like, yeah, enjoy, go ahead, have fun. Um, which is just like I said, he's just a good dude. So. But I will give him a little plug here, just because he was nice enough. Um, if you want, check out Castlemania Games. I'll put a link in the description to their website. You can buy anything there if you want to. Uh, but let's see here. Let's open this up. I'm going to destroy this box. I can tell already it's not going to make it, which is a shame. But sometimes boxes must be sacrificed. Uh, this is not a logically designed box. It's just not. Ooh, that looks fancy. OK. Uh, Right on. Okay, okay, we got two items in here. Take them out. What we have here is Holy Diver Collector's Edition, as well as R-Type and Super R-Type Collector's Edition. Right, okay, so you'll have to forgive me. I'm sure a lot of you out there already know what this is, and you're super excited about it. I'm not gonna lie, I only know the extreme basics of this. Um, so what this is, uh, this is a new collector's edition for a game called Holy Diver. This is an NES game. Uh, and this one is a new Super Nintendo game of R-Type, the third lighting, um, yeah, no, third lightning, sorry, as well as Super R-Type. They're essentially re-releases and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I know, I'm sure there's a lot of you out there who are very frustrated because you're like, I know all the details about it, like, like the equivalency of what I would do for Shenmue. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't know enough about it. Um, I just, I knew the, I knew the basics because he kind of just sent them and then he was like, yeah, these are, you know, they're, they're re-releases. That's like literally all I know about them, so I do apologize. Um, but let's take a look and open them up here. Uh, inside the R-Type, we have a certificate of authenticity. This is number five of 2,900. Wow, that's a low print run. Um, then we have the Super Nintendo style box. Maybe, I think the game's probably in there. Uh, and then just have some collector's edition goodies. Things by Retrobit, that's cool. This little 
card thing. Oh, it's like a journal. That's awesome. And what else is in here, if anything? Sorry. No, it's just, this is just, oh, there's a pin. Okay, I see. Yeah, and then there's this cool pin. Nice. Uh, and I, I'm gonna assume the other one's very similar, but let's take a look at it. Just give me a second um, to put this away. And we'll put, yeah, we'll put that in there. Actually, let's take a look at the cartridge, shall we? Uh, just give me one second here. Uh, bear with me, bear with me, bear with me. It's a very nice set, it really is. Um, open it up from the side. And then we have the cartridge, which has a manual as well. And it comes on a black Super Nintendo cartridge, which is very cool. Very nice, by Retrobit. Uh, yeah, it just has R-Type and Super R-Type. Very awesome. But yeah, uh, much like the Star Fox 3 thing, or Star Fox 2 thing, Star Fox 3. Yeah, Star Fox 3 confirmed. Um, <laughs> it's, it's cool, man, that uh, cartridge stuff is getting even more uh, recognition now, and like more indies and stuff like that. Because the idea as a kid that anyone could just make their own Super Nintendo games one day, to me was, of course, you know, mind-blowing. Now it's like almost common practice, so that's really, really awesome. Uh, so let me put the certificate there, uh, and then this. Actually, let me, I'll finish closing that up later. Let's take a quick look at the other one as well. Uh, we have, let's open it up from here. Very, very nice wrapping. Um, yeah, I, I didn't, it's a very nice collector set, it really is. And I apologize again for all the people I'm frustrating because I'm sure a lot of you know a lot about this thing and are just kind of frustrated that I'm sitting here in kind of ignorance, to be honest with you. But I'm trying, I'm being honest. Um, this is Holy Diver, like number 25 of 2900. Uh, there is the NES style box. Uh, and then it includes uh, this thing. And then under that is uh, some postcards. And then it too comes with a journal. And then under that, ooh, that's got something different. It's got a pin, but it also has this fig pin. It has like a, oh, this is like a light. That's kind of cool. Look at that, that's really neat. Yeah, this is a, this is a collector's set done very well. Um, yeah, very, very awesome. Let me finish putting this away here. Uh, oh, sorry. These things are hard to put away uh, <laughs> when you're doing it in a rush. Um, but that goes there. Then the book, then the paper, then this thing, which means I have to correct that one. And then you sit down, we've got the game. Let's take a quick look at the game. And inside we have, ooh, just a random little piece of plastic. And behind that, we have the cartridge. Holy Diver for the NES. Very cool. Yeah, um, again, I, I know it's frustrating because I don't know enough about these particular releases, but thank you very much to Ryan for hooking me up with them. That was still very cool of you to do. Um, I'm looking forward to checking them out. Instruction manual as well as dust cover thing. So it's all there. Uh, so at this point, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put all this stuff away. We have to stop here and I'm gonna have to bring out this really big box. This is gonna be, it's gonna be something. You see? <laughs> Look at this thing. Um, okay, so the story with this goes that a buddy of mine, Rob Janos, who you guys might know the name of, he's been on my podcast before, he's a regular Patreon backer, he's usually shouted out in that podcast. Um, I even hang out with him a lot of the time when I'm in New York. He contacted me and was just like, I sent you something, don't open it until Playload, you gotta do it there. And he didn't tell me anything else. I have no idea what's in this, we're gonna discover this together. Uh, it's, it's big, obviously, but it's really not that heavy, so part of me thinks, like, maybe he puts just a bunch of newspaper in there just to troll me live, I don't know. But let's, uh, let's, let's do it. Let's open this up. Uh, okay. And on this side, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm really curious. What could be this big but this light? So, there's our tape. Put that down there. Put this over here. There's a letter attached to it. Damn, this is, dude, this is like a lot of words. Why is it? Okay. Uh, okay, uh, uh, okay this is like double-sided letter time. Uh, Dear Adam, I hope this package finds you well, hopefully relaxing at home after another jet-setting adventure. I know that you don't uh, readily accept donations to your collection slash channel, but I truly felt that this belongs with you and not me. It's true, by the way, don't send me stuff. In this case, he already had my address, he did it on his own. 
your channel has provided me with hours of entertainment and information as well as uh, seeing as an invaluable, as, as, as serving as an invaluable resource for my video game history class that I taught this spring. I look forward to seeing your video featuring this system, passing along more fun and interesting stories uh, from the annals of video game history. Cheers. See you at AVGC, Rob Janos, which is true. AVGC, a convention in New Jersey. Uh, later this month in September, I will be there. Um, P.S. The system does work, and you can find more detailed instructions on the next page. Um, so, okay, spoilers. It's a system. Thank you, Rob. That's very nice of you. Um, I'm going to maybe not read this part until we know what it is in case that spoils it. But let's take a look. Um, I saw it. Really, dude? All right, there's one person watching other than Rob. I'm gonna say, I give you a shout out here because the second I say your name, you're gonna know what, it's, what it is. Jesse. How are you? We just we just looked at one of these. You just got one of these. And apparently now I've got one. Wow. Um, okay, well, I guess I'm going to read this and we'll see through context clues uh, if anybody knows what this is. I recently picked up this system through Craig, a Craigslist ad and I've tested the console and it does work, albeit with some limitations. The system is missing the overlays and I've only got a couple of the number of the cartridges working, namely number, numbers one and five. On the plus side, I'm sure you can get it working more reliably with a proper cleaning. I've also included a custom made RF cable and coax adapter in the box so it can be played on a TV with an antenna input slash cable input. There are also the, the batteries needed in the console itself, so it's all ready to go. Rob. You, historians out there, you have a couple of seconds to guess. Rob, dude, I hope you didn't spend much on this. Dude, just, dude, you shouldn't have done this. I'm just throwing out the newspapers. I was right about the newspapers, that part I got right. The, this, I did not see coming. Dude. See if I can get this out of here reliably. This is insane. Okay, put that, well, hopefully you guys see that. You guys see me as well. Move this. <sighs> guys, it's a Magnavox Odyssey. Uh, so obviously he hooked me up with this to be able to do a, a first gen recap on this. And again, Jesse, you are probably sitting there laughing because you're the only person who's like, wow, that's funny timing. I was hanging out with a dude named Jesse in San Francisco and he just picked one of these up and he was showing it to me and he was all excited about it. I was like, that's so cool. I, like, that's only the second time I've ever seen one. Little did I know. Thank you, Rob. Um, wow, all right, let's, I just wanna take a quick look at it. All right, careful, 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 careful. Um, this is, I'm gonna give you the extremely abridged history of this thing. Uh, this is a first gen video game console. This is the first console that ever used cartridges. Most first gen consoles only were Pong clones. This was the first one that tried to do anything different. Each one of these little cards would be a different game or a different, frankly, a different kind of iteration of Pong, but they were more creative about it. Um, it is the, like, it, it, man, I'm gonna have to go over this at some point, but it's got a whole bunch of stuff on there. He, uh, he literally included a, a disc called Magnavox Odyssey Setup by Richard Sanford. I don't know what that means exactly, but it's probably just a, some instructions on how to use it. Uh, very, very unique console. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, I've said for a long time, this is the only console in the first generation that is interesting to me because every single one of them, like I said, they're just Pong clones, but this one actually said, no, nah, I'm gonna use like cartridges and I'm gonna be, my own thing. That's so cool. That's the console. Uh, hideously ugly, <laughs> very 1970s. Um, controllers look kind of like weird old Star Trek phasers or something or some sort of, you know, reading device, but that's so crazy. Rob, dude, I hope you didn't pay much for this. I really hope you didn't pay much. These, these things are not cheap. Um, so I really hope you didn't pay much for this because I'll feel guilty forever. Um, Jesse, I'll probably be messaging you about information as far as like how to maybe properly clean it. Cause I've, I've never opened one of these. I've never, 
I've literally the second time I even saw one was only a couple weeks ago, and that was in San Francisco. Um, and I certainly didn't open it. Uh, so to clean it is is a bold endeavor. Uh, hopefully I can do that. Um, but wow. Okay, I'm going to put it away now, uh, and <laughs> we're going to wrap this up. Rob, thank you so much. That's um, that's something. It's seriously something. Thank you. Um, I don't even know what to say because I, I really never expected to own one of these. So thank you very much for that. So off the top of my head, I'm sorry if I forget anybody here. Uh, thank you to Rob for this. Uh, thank you to Ryan at Castle Mania Games. Again, check out Castle Mania Games. Thank you to Sega for the stuff they hooked me up with. Thank you to Ben. Thank you to John Riggs. Uh, thank you to Radical Reggie. Um, thank you to Tom for the Dreamcast. Thank you to Jake, a.k.a. Zebular, for uh, Super, Fam uh, Super Nintendo, Star Fox 2. And I think that's it. I don't, I don't think there's anybody else. So if, I, if there was someone else in there, I do apologize. Oh, and thank you to my friend for helping me get easier access to Masaya Matsu, Matsukaze, so I get that sign, um, as well as James and Brendan. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you all later.